Amen and hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, join your hearts with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for your infinite mercy and grace. Lord, doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Lord, you came to this earth, Lord, as a babe. Lord, as we just celebrated you coming to earth. And Lord, we stand in awe, Lord, of you living a sinless life. The great call and command upon every Christian and every one of your children to come before you and live according to your word. With the faith that produces obedience in our heart. For the truth that's been set before us is a guide into what is righteous, holy, and good. But Lord, we have stumbled. Lord, we all have gone astray like sheep. Lord, we sin. We come before you this morning, Lord, as sinners in need of grace, in need of understanding of your holiness in a greater way. So Lord, speak to our souls powerfully this morning. Lord, may your word convict us. Lord, your law affect our conscience in such a way that we see our great need for you. Lord, help us. Our pride and our hard hearts, Lord, disallow the truth and the power of that message, Lord, to truly overwhelm us. So, Lord, I pray for our pastor to bring that word upon us, to bear upon our souls with such weight, Lord, that we see you as holy, completely and utterly. Lord, so we thank you for the privilege that we have of hearing your voice, Lord, being brought together to worship and praise the holy and righteous one, the one that's full of power and glory and mercy and grace. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this infinite plan you set before us. Lord, we remember the gospel. Lord, that in that sinless life that you led, sinners put you to death on a cross, and you suffered the wrath of your Father in our place. But Lord, our last enemy couldn't hold you. That is death. Lord, you rose on the third day. You ascended to the Father and are interceding for us right now. Lord Jesus, we praise you. So Lord, help us to see our catalog. Help us to see ourselves in the light of your holiness and of your glory and goodness in such a way, Lord, we'd be changed. Lord, we praise you that you've established us here in this nation, at this place and at this time. We pray for all of our elected officials. Lord, you'd bring wisdom upon their souls. Lord, they would guide with righteousness. Lord, doing what's right in your eyes. Lord, awaken this country so spiritually dead. Revive your people, Lord, for revival begins with us to obey your word. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters that aren't with us this morning in sickness and distress. We pray for, Lord, the health and the happiness and the glory to be revealed in every one of our hearts, Lord, as this word comes upon us. Lord, that we would go forth in joy, understanding these mercies from heaven above to speak the truth to our friends and neighbors. Lord, bless your people for your glory this way we pray in Jesus name amen so brothers and sisters as COVID affects this culture it certainly affected me and I apologize last week I breezed right over the privilege of reading God's Word to you which is one of my great joys of life but there was a section of scripture in James chapter 3 that right over my head and um, this is a malady for me with COVID. I went to my dentist and walked right out without paying. It's a really strange event that it affects my mind, even though it's a lung issue. So this morning, looking carefully, <laughs> I will have the privilege of reading to you the verse of the law in Exodus chapter 20, and then section of Philippians chapter 4. So brothers and sisters, if you would stand for the reading of God's word. <coughs> you shall
shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in all and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except for you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and, and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to the Lord. And may God, and may our God meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And God bless the reader's word of your soul. Amen. So we're continuing um, looking at knowing and delighting in the God of the Ten Commandments, and I'll explain at the end how there'll be uh, one more message, Lord willing, uh, kind of a conclusion to that series that we've been in on the Ten Commandments, and kind of an introduction into the next series uh, that we'll be going through. I'll explain more about that later. But the purpose of the series of messages in Exodus 20 has been to more fully appreciate the God of the Ten Commandments, um, to see the Lord in the midst of the commandments and how the Lord deepens the commandments. And in the 10th commandment, God condemns covetousness. And the title of this message is one of the most commonly broken yet overlooked commandments. And the central idea is God prohibits covetousness. So Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you. Lord, uh, for bringing us uh, through this week into entering into a new week, and for this moment now, Lord, that we uh, can continue in the spirit of worship and praise to you. Help us to see, Lord, how you came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And help us, Lord, give us ears to hear, hearts to recognize. Uh, what you're speaking to us through your word here this morning, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Exodus 20, 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. And I thought this week, I don't covet my neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And I thought to myself, I don't covet my neighbor's wife, and or his male servant, or his female servants, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And I thought, yeah, I don't covet my neighbor's cars or my neighbor's house or my neighbor's stuff. So I'm like, all right, the Tenth Commandment. And then, of course, when you think about it and you pray about it and you 
read Philippians 4 about being content in Christ, and, and then you have the richness of uh, men of God who have gone before us, like Thomas Watson, who wrote this book on the Ten Commandments, and you read his chapter on that, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah. I call it. Or you read, and there's not a lot of guys presently living, I mean, I like the dead guys, because I know how they finish, but then I was given this book by Edwin P. Clowney on how Jesus transforms the Ten Commandments, and I've been reading that along uh, with the series, and, and it just gives you insight, right, into uh, the Word of God along with the truth of the Scripture. So we got here, you shall not covet. So again, you may think, I don't know, if you're like me, you may think, yeah, all right, out of ten, I probably maybe have the least trouble with the, this last one. Then I read, and I think in the scripture, I read something that I'm going to quote later on here from Thomas Watson, how covetedness is uh, seen in the other commandments as well. When you're, it's a desire, covet, covet means to delight in, that's what it means in the original, to delight in, or to set one's desire on something. And I thought maybe this would be the best definition. It means to be greedy for something. You really want something. And if the Bible's true, and it is, where it says the heart is deceitful above all else, and the heart is the seedbed there of where our sin is, there's lots of things, as Jesus, it broadens the commandment and deepens the commandment, as we'll see. There's lots of things that maybe we, not maybe, likely that we desire or crave an inordinate desire. This is how you know we're all guilty of being covetous is because it's a selfish desire. It's something that we want, right? That um, would not be honoring or pleasing to God. And we'll see that. So it's to long for or to feel delight in something or someone else or we'll get there. It says here, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. So the commandment obviously forbids coveting anything that belongs to our neighbor. I used this illustration, I think, this past week somewhere. And um, it was like in a Better Homes and Gardens magazine or something like that. The guy, you know how guys are with their yards, if they have a yard or their property sometimes. Some guys are like really meticulous. Remember like my grandfather, that man had a patch of grass that was... Maybe. I'm, not, I'm exaggerating, but it was right hand. It wasn't really that big. And he'd be out there watering that thing, and he watered that thing every night. And he'd sit there and he'd water that thing, and he really was into his lawn. And some guys are like that. I'm kind of into wanting my yard to look like, look pretty good. And, and the guy in Better Homes and Gardens, I'm saying, I don't know if that's what it was, he does his yard, he manicures it with all the right tools and all the best equipment. And uh, Ben knows about all. Ben sends you pictures of him driving that cab of different things when he was doing the landscaping stuff, right? It's like, we're into that stuff. So this guy in the magazines, like he cuts his grass, he manicures and everything, and he sits out on his deck, and he looks over his kingdom, and he says, wow, look how great this really looks, and then he kind of glances over to the yard next door, and he's like, oh, mine looks kind of lousy compared to the way that one looks. That's the, the most basic form of covetedness, coveting. Matthew Henry said the foregoing commandments implicitly forbid all desire of doing that which will be an injury to our neighbor. This forbids all in order of desire of having that which will be a gratification to ourselves and certainly a gratification to ourselves at the expense of others. So the essence of this covetousness really is pursuing happiness and joy in something or someone other than God. And we need to understand, I think, in a better way, in a deeper way. You know, we've been in this series, of the, going back to the basics, but we're, we're looking at it in the light of, you know, just getting deeper. You know, basics are, the basics are good because it helps deepen our faith. So to be greedy for something. We're all greedy by nature for something. You know that? You know, you know that, right? You are all, we are all greedy by nature for something. You know what that something is, or that someone is? Really, it is. It's by nature greedy for self, comfort, 
pleasure, ease of life, control, a whole bunch of things that we could be. So we're thinking about the essence of this commandment, coveting, right? Inordinate desire for something that when you don't have it, you're not a happy camper. Okay? Covetedness, that the essence of that. Um, what does a covetous, sinful nature look like in the life of the child of God? And again, I think not just wanting other people's stuff, yes, that's certainly it. Or being envious, yes, that's certainly it, although that's just part of it. But we need to deal, I think, with a broader context, too, here. Um, strong, selfish desire for something, and when we don't get it, I already said that. Sin is manifested in our life in a whole different bunch of ways when we don't get what we want. I mean, you think of the most basic reaction to when there's something that we don't, that we really want, and we don't get it. What's an emotion that comes out? Anger. Um, even being impatient. Has the root there of covetedness, and, and the more I thought about it, even this morning, uh, we're going to look at Genesis three six in a minute. But greed, covetedness, and pride, pride, kind of go close together there. Um, so we need to remember that, as we've been seeing in this series of messages of the commandments, Jesus deepens them. Um, gets to the heart of the matter uh, behind each one of these sins. Matthew 5, verse 17. And um, this might be where we'll conclude this series, Lord willing, next week and begin the next series on the law of God. I'll, again, I'll explain more about that in a minute. But Matthew 5, 17, and we mentioned this verse throughout the series, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all it is accomplished. Until all is accomplished. And we know the law in the life of the unbeliever is meant to help them to see their sin, and they cannot keep the commandments, and they need a Savior, and they're all, they're all, uh, they've broken all, every single one of them. Right? As we have. Uh, and as we still are capable of presently doing. So for the unbeliever, it's to point to their desperate need to be saved. For the believer, they're there just as a reminder of our sin, to help us to grow in Christ-likeness and holiness and sanctification. And I think also to help us just have just a... I mean, we sang some really great hymns and choruses Today, I probably apologize for the technical difficulty again with not being able to see the words, but um, we sang some beautiful choruses that just get at the essence of what's going on uh, in our heart. And for the believer, the law, or even just any sin that we commit, it's just to draw us into deeper, 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 more profound appreciation for what we've been saved from, who we've been saved for, and how we're to put to death the deeds of the flesh, how we're to walk in newness of life, how we're to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And so really, the commandments of the life of the believer are meant, for the unbeliever, it's meant to draw him to Christ to be saved. For the believer, it's meant to draw us closer and closer to Christ and run to that cross in the throne room of grace to receive mercy and help in our time of need and to draw nearer to Him. So... In, so, I, I, I would put it this way. You know, it says Psalm 37, 4, I think it is. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. We are people who delight in things and want things. And Jesus is not asking for us to desire less. But I do believe the principles of Scripture is he's, he's desiring that we delight more in him and find the secret of contentment that Paul spoke about in the other verses that John read. But look at, let me read to you, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Perfect garden, 
paradise, no sin. Then, where do I want to start? I was just going to read verse 6. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. We know this account of the story very well. For God knows in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good for good and evil. So he's, she, he's applying to that pride right there. Right? Pride. Verse 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, there's the desire part, there's the covetousness part, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from a fruit and ate it, and she gave also to her husband, and he ate it. So, it's basically the sin of Adam and Eve there. There's the pride element that Satan went after, and there's a coveting desire too there, having something that they didn't have, or couldn't, weren't supposed to have, knowledge of good and evil and Satan is like, God's withholding something from you. You can eat of that tree. You won't surely die. And he lied and everything else. The father of lies. And um, appeal to that covetousness and the heart there. And then a couple other examples in scripture. Um, I mentioned, we mentioned this one last week. But the classic one maybe is David. 2 Samuel 11, 2 through 4, we used this as an illustration last week. When evening came, David rose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. And then he repented and went back into his palace and got on his knees and asked the Lord to forgive him for coveting his neighbor's wife, right? And he repented. No. He took it another one step further. He sent and inquired about the woman and said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And so he inquired. He sent messengers. And then he took her, and she came to him and lay with him. And when she purified herself from uncleanliness, he returned to her house. And you know the story there. So there's covetedness there. Many examples in uh, Scripture. Joshua, chapter 7, verses 20 through 21, the sin of Achan. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me, and what he done he took. Um, some of the uh, spoil, it says in verse 21. But 20 says, So we can answer Joshua and say, Truly I have sinned against the Lord and the Lord God of Israel. This is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold and 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are concealed in the earth beside my tent with the silver underneath it. Covetedness. Thomas Watson, in his book, and I would lend to anybody the book on the Ten Commandments by Watson or How Jesus Transforms the Ten Commandments, um, anybody that'd like to borrow it or you know where you can get it, he said, Covetedness is a mother sin. Let me read to you what he meant by that. Covetedness is a mother sin. I shall make you see how that covetedness is a breach of all the commandments. And I'm just going to read this. I never really thought about this until I read this this week. It breaks the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods but one. The covetous man has more than gods than one. That would be himself. Amidal, idolatry. No other god. He has a god of gold. He is called an idolater. Covetedness breaks the second commandment. Thou shalt not make any graven image. Thou shalt not bow thyself to them. A covetous man bows down, though not to the graven image of the church, yet to the graven image in his coin or, you know, pocket, worldly things. Covetous is the breach of the third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain. You think about that, how that would be a breaking of the third commandment. You're taking the name of the Lord in vain. As a child of God, you're showing that you had a desire for something and your desire for something greater than God in that moment 
is producing all different types of sin in your heart and life. Covetousness is a breaking of the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. A covetous man does not keep the Sabbath holy. He will ride to fairs on a Sabbath. Instead of reading in the Bible, he'll cast up his accounts. And you can think about different ways that, in that moment, how covetedness is, can be, not in all instances of any of these things, but can be, I, got, I covet the approval of my in-laws or my family, and that could lead to covetedness and breaking the commandment. It can. Not every instance where that happens, but it can. That's just one example of that. Or how many times I've heard people say, I, got, I don't have time, I, I, I got to cook, I, I got I to gotta get the house, I got to... I've heard that like multiple times. That's what's a good thing like when you've been around... And I say that, I, I say that those are illustrations, things that I've heard in 22 years here, but, but I'm no different, and in some instances worse. Or John, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't give John Harris an example. <laughs> what we talk about, we're wretched, we're broken. I'm guilty. We're busted. We're busted like that. <laughs> Especially not on tape. Oh dear, okay. Um, where am I? Covetous is the breach of the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and mother. So maybe there is a time when you're honoring your father and mother and you're sort of and you're not worshiping together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. That could be true too. A covetous person does not honor his father if he does not feed him with money, with it with money. And then he says something here. Now he will get his father to make over his estate to him in his lifetime while he's alive so that the Father may be at his Son's command. Covetous is the breach of the Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not kill. Covetous Ahab, we read this last week, killed Naboth to get his vineyard. Covetous is the breach of the Seventh Commandment. Obviously, thou shalt not commit adultery. Covetous breaks the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. I just read about Achan stealing for the wedge of gold. Covetousness is a breach of the Ninth Commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness. What makes the perjurer take a false oath but covetousness? He hopes for a reward. Yeah, Judas at the heart was, he took, he, he took the silver, right? Kept the bag, was kept, the, kept the purse. And obviously, the Ten Commandment, thou shalt not covet. So, Let's start thinking about applying this here. You shall not covet. God prohibits covetedness. Because God prohibits covetedness. Let's repent. Let's repent, church, saved people, of our sinful love of self. That's the essence of it. Of covetedness. My heart desires and wants and longs for something. Maybe it's not my neighbor's wife. Not, maybe it's not my neighbor's house. Maybe it's not my neighbor's goods. But the heart is deceitful above all else. And I'm longing for something. And we want something that we have to have. <laughs> I don't know if anybody would remember this. But I, I shared this illustration once or twice before, and I think this week. We were at a carnival, we were in Oxford, we were with our family, and the children were all little, and there was one child there who was crying and crying and crying and crying and crying and crying, and crying wanted the balloon, or wanted the whatever it was that her brother or sister had, just screaming, crying, bloody murder, and wanting to have, find the parents as a right or when they bought the same exact thing. And the child went, and they glanced over, and I mean, almost, it was simultaneous. It was like a combustible moment. She's like, oh, I got it. But then she looked, I want that! I mean, like, in the same breath, the same breath of, no, I want that. That's the coveted heart, heart that covets that longs for something. It isn't satisfied. That's why the cure to that covetousness is being content. 
in Christ, which we'll get at. But let's repent of our sinful love of self. That's at the heart of covetousness. Romans 13, verses 8 through 11. Hold on, I got mixed up here. Here we go. Romans. Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And there is another commandment, it is summed up in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Probably the last message in the series should be that, Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Love your neighbor as yourself. Fulfillment of the law. That's Matthew 22, 36-40. So let's repent. Lord, help us to see. Just a kid is saving being your... You, you, you could think for yourself as you're sitting there all the different ways that maybe you're guilty of breaking the 10th commandment. And again, for the believer, that's meant to draw us deeper in our relationship with him and move us to repentance. Let's repent of covetedness by rendering, remembering who we belong to in the first place. 1 Corinthians 3.23 says, but you are Christ's child of God. You belong to Christ. And it says in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 through 20, let me read it, I was going to just paraphrase it, but I may lose something by doing that, so let's just read it. Flee immorality. Okay, so that's obvious. Fornication. Sex before marriage. Taking something from someone that you had no right to take from them. It's covetedness. That, that's what drew the person into that sin. Covetousness. And think of all the stimulation out there that just feeds that, like we were having trouble yesterday uh, starting a fire. I didn't have enough kindling wood, and I, we managed to get it going. Once it gets going and it's hot, it just it burned like all day. It went. My like Erica and Jordan came down, and my dad was there, and we were celebrating Christmas because we didn't get to do that with them. And, and um, I'm like, Erica's like, "Well, get Jordan to blow on it and go like that. You got to stoke that fire." And, and the sin of all that sexual sin gets so stoked and and, and runs hot of all the stimulus that's out there. And the fool just runs headlong right into it. The Bible says, no, flee. Run from it. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral person sins against his own body. And then, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So we need to remember, if we want to repent and we want to um, flee from the sin of covetousness, we need to remember who it is that we belong to. Let's repent of covetedness by being good stewards of what God has given to us. It's an obvious application. Proverbs 3 9 says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first fruit, the first of your produce, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. I have not known in the 22 years that I've been here or I've ever heard of someone say that they sought to honor the Lord with their giving, sought to give the Lord the first fruits, sought to follow the different uh, scriptures as it relates to giving and giving cheer cheerfully and, and uh, planning what you give and, and practicing tithing as a beginning basic point for giving. I've not ever heard of one, I've not, in 22 years. And these are people with various and different degrees of income. But this church, we've never had like a, uh, you know, an abundance of wealth in any families. But regardless of what their level of income was, I've never heard them say, oh wow, and I couldn't meet my bills, and I couldn't pay. You'd hear the opposite over and over and over and over again. The Lord provided. The Lord was faithful. 
And I, you know, and that's not why we give. We give out of obedience to the Lord and love for Him and appreciation to for Him. But I never heard that anybody ever say, "Yeah, and I'm." I've heard the other though. I have. I've heard the other. Will a man rob God? Malachi three eight says. Robbing is covetousness. I rob because I want something, or holding on to something, or I'm not trusting with something. Yet you're robbing me, but you say, how have you robbed you in times and offerings? You are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you, bring the whole time into the storehouse, so there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, saying the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you a blessing, until it overflows. So there's that principle of giving first fruits. And I'm not ashamed to say using tithe as a basic a starting point. Got to start somewhere. And I, I just know that from practical experience. Got to start somewhere. And we're to go beyond that even. But So let's be good stewards of what God has given to us. Yes, I know money. Yes, I know time. Yes, I know all of it. Right? All of it. All right. Let's repent of covetedness by trusting in God's providence for us. I don't know where I read that this week or where that thought came into my brain, but I was like, wow, I never thought that. Covetedness. Somehow, Worry, we'll read Matthew 6 here in a minute, it is true. Worry, anxiety, somehow, it says there's a covetous this heart there that can't trust in God's providence. What? Yeah. Um, Matthew 6. Oh, I have to read it from this Bible because. That page got torn out of that one. Matthew 6. I suppose I should go back to verse 19, but for now I'm going to just go to verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the year. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them, and are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? So think about that. Again, how is covetousness and not trusting in God's provision, not trusting in God's sovereignty, not trusting in God's providence for our lives, how those are related. When we're not trusting, we're living like, and I read something else this week from somebody else that just hit me too, but it's, it's we're trusting in ourselves. And we're living like it all depends upon us. Why would we do that? Because we can't Trust, if you're struggling with that issue, you can't trust, you're not trusting in God's sovereignty. You're not trusting in God's providence. Should have brought that quote. That was a great quote. It actually was from John MacArthur Jr. I'll have to find it and share it in a text or something this week. Verse is 33 through 34. says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble as its own. Your life is a vapor, it's a hand breath. Um, and there's a covetous, covetous heart somehow that's related to that, not being able to trust in God's providential providence over our lives. Maybe that leads to this. Let's repent of covetousness by learning the secret of contentment. Right? And uh, that was the Philippians 4, 10. I searched in vain all week for this book. 
It was on my bookshelf. I'm determined that it's still on the bookshelf, but I looked like all week long. I couldn't find it, because I was going to say, hey, if anybody wants to borrow this book, because I'm going to quote from it in a minute, um, it's a really good book on contentment. It's, and I can't even think of the, mem the name. It's uh, Jeremiah Burleson, Art, wait, I get these two confused. There's one, The Art of Divine Contentment, and there's one, The Secret of Contentment. I forget which book. One is by Thomas Watson, and I had that book, but I didn't bring it out here. The other is by Jeremiah Burroughs. Let me just read the quote from Jeremiah Burroughs. I can't find it. I must have lent it to somebody, maybe. A Christian finds satisfaction in any circumstance by going outside of himself to Christ. That's the essence of Philippians 4. I'm going to read again here in a minute. By his faith, acting upon Christ and bringing the strength of Jesus Christ into his own soul, he is thereby enabled to bear whatever God lays on him by the strength that he finds from God. The jewel of divine contentment. I think that's what it's called by Jeremiah Burroughs. I think the art of divine contentment is by Thomas Watson. I recommend either one of those books, and I can lend you one of them, another one if I can find it, but I don't think I can. For Philippians 4, 10 says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you've concerned, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. So there's a relationship between being content in our circumstances and being covetous, covet, covet, coveting. When we're not happy or content in our circumstances, our heart is coveting or longing for something else that's not maybe there right now. Maybe it's just me, you know, maybe it's just me struggling in these areas. You know, as I get older, and as anybody gets older and things you start to lose things, and you start to lose. I mean, I have. Um, and there's just different seasons of life, right? And different things happen. So circumstances in your life happen and change. And sometimes, you know, when you get older, like you got relatives that deal with, okay, they can't drive anymore, they can't do this anymore, and then it's a difficult difficulty for them to be content. Though we have to be content in our circumstances, whatever lot. The Lord has put us in, or we're in, because our contentment and our joy and our satisfaction is in the Lord, not in all the other stuff, because all the other stuff is going to go anyways, and it does go, right? I know how to be, I know how to get along with humble means, I know how to live in prosperity. In every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, help us to learn that secret of being content in you. Let's be a people, a couple more here, who store up treasures in heaven instead of storing up treasures on earth. And that's the other part of Matthew. Just before the don't worry stuff, we got Matthew 6, verse 19. Storing up treasures. You can't serve the Lord in ministry and and, and lay, your, lay your life down for someone else and practice Philippians 2, putting the other person's needs before your own. You won't do anything to serve the Lord with a covetous heart because it's all about me. Even to the extent of, okay, you know, again, I, I'm not pointing fingers and nothing like this is happening now, but I'm saying, uh, can you give somebody a ride somewhere? Well, I don't know. And then someone said to me, what did they say to us this week? Just do it! Just, just help! Just make it happen! Okay? Don't go through... But the co it's covetedness. My, my schedule will not allow this. I had that with a relative of mine once. camera going, but it was like, oh, one of my relatives, I need to get to the doctor, it was after I fell off of the scaffold and 15 feet, and the neurologist in Fairfield wanted to see me, and I was young, so I was like, all right, forget it, don't worry about it. Can you take me to the, I can't, I can't do it. I'm like, what? You can't, I'm not going to say who it was. You can't do that? You can't. Put yourself aside even a little smidge just to. And 
I'm like, all right, fine, I'm just going to go. And then you go. But there's a, it's me first. Can I read it? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And I've done the same thing as that illustration. One time, one of our, I won't give that illustration. But I, again, I'm just saying, you have life illustrations, you have examples of things that have happened, you've seen coverage that just played out, and you're busted just like that. I'm busted just like that. Worse, worse. Because that person I was talking about wasn't a Christian at that point. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. That's the essence of the roadblock to serve the Lord in ministry. Where your treasure is, treasure me. There your heart will be also. And you will be, we will be paralyzed and guilty of covetousness. Not ever thinking about that before. Colossians 3, 1 through 2. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Set your mind on things above, not on yourself. All right, here's a good illustration. This is from the Clowny book, and we're almost, we're almost done. Check this one out. Just after the verse, set your mind on things above, Clowney gives this illustration. This is the treasure that the Reverend Jack Arnold stored up. After retiring from the ministry, he and his wife wore themselves out. Yeah. It's okay to wear yourself out for the Lord. In selfless service for the kingdom, traveling to scores of small villages and hamlets to encourage Christians in their marriages and to teach them the word of God. The treasure they stored up for themselves in retirement was kingdom treasure, not stocks and bonds. When Jack died on January 11, 2005, the Drudge Report picked up the story. The Reverend Jack Arnold, 69, was nearing the end of his sermon Sunday at the Covenant Presbyterian Church in the Orlando suburb when he grabbed the podium before falling to the floor, said the Reverend Michael C. Bates, associate pastor at Covenant Presbyterian and before collapsing, Arnold quoted the 18th century Bible scholar John Wesley, who said, Until my work on this earth is done, I am immortal. But when my work for Christ is done, I go to be with Jesus. That's the treasure of heaven, driving that behavior, right? His treasure was in heaven. Amen. Amen. Let's kill the sin of covetousness before it kills us. Sin will kill us. The unsaved person, sin will kill them. The covetousness of lying, any of the commandments busted, will literally cost them their soul. We as believers do want to kill the sin and be sanctified in Christ. Ephesians 5 3 says, But immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. He's writing to believers here. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather give thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man, covetous man who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. People walk down aisles, People raise their hand. People say that they're a child of God and they live their life in total immorality and whatever the sin is. And they're saying that they're a child of God and the people around them are saying, yeah, you're, we believe you're, you're safe. And there's no biblical evidence. We've talked about this and said this a million times. The scripture says here that that person who's coveted, coveting or an immoral, living in immoral immorality, that's an example here, they have no part in the kingdom of heaven. Their sin will take them to hell. And that's ultimately what sin does. Right? Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. 
Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body, Paul saying to the believers, as dead to immorality. And if it's not dead to it, then there's a spiritual problem there. Not we don't struggle, not we don't slump, slip, but when we're living in sin of any kind and we're confronted by the Word of God and a Nathan comes alongside of us and says, mm -hmm, and they go, yes, I am the man. And we, the person repents, like David repented. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it's because of these things, Paul says, that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And then you also once walked, not presently walking, not keep on walking, not keep on saying in it, once walked. All right, last one here. We did this last week, but let's be in 2022 a people, let's be a 2 Peter 3, 18 people, okay? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever until the day of eternity. Let's be a people in 2022, a 2 Peter 3, 18 people growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord as it relates to all 10 commandments, as it relates to this commandment, thou shalt not covet. Let's be one growing in our relationship, in our understanding, in our appreciation of the Lord. And let's walk in a manner, as Paul said in Ephesians 4.1, in a manner worthy of the Lord. God prohibits covetousness. Covetousness. I had a hard time explaining this, pronouncing that. I had to actually ask Siri, how do you pronounce the word covetousness? How is God inviting you to respond to this commandment prohibiting covetousness? It's a comprehensive commandment. It's given to us from God. It calls us to repent of all love except for love for God. It calls us to repent of love for self. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we are closing the promise. 1 Corinthians 12, 31. But eagerly desire, eagerly desire the greater gifts. And I will show you the way, the most excellent way. And he speaks there about love in chapter 13, verse 1. Desire the greatest, the greater gifts. Love, desire, covet, love in that sense. Love for the Lord, love for others. Let's ask the Lord to fill us with a greater ability to love Him and to love others. And again, Jesus showed us that the commandments pointed to him. In the 10th commandment, he's not asking us to desire less, but to desire more of him, that we would be content in him. The quote for the week is in your bulletin. It's from Edward P. Clowney. The treasure of heaven is Christ himself, the Lord of heaven. We do not set our minds on rewards that may be ours, but on Jesus. We desire the Lord more than his gifts. Stop. Have you found the joy and treasure of the kingdom of heaven? Have you found that joy, that pearl of great price? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, and when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found that one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. And the commandment says that we shall not, we shall not covet. Lord Jesus, thank you. Help us to covet you in the sense, desire you above all else. Help us to see those areas, Lord, where we're guilty of this because of our wickedness of our heart. And help us to repent and to draw near to you. And Lord, if there be someone here who is unsaved, who is not regenerate, who has not called upon the name of the Lord to save him or her, pray, Lord, that they would turn to you in repentance and faith today and say, I've busted all ten of them, and I am in need of a Savior. I cannot save myself. But God promised that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And maybe there's someone here, Lord, that you're wanting to move from. Once they once were such, 
Once that was who they were. Once that was what their identity was. Once that was what their nature was. Once that was who they were and it was carried out in so many different sinful ways. But now, they are Christ's. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. The whole new has come. Help people, Lord, to enter into that newness of life in you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.